I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. Joining me again today is Brookings Core Response Executive Director and good friend, Diana Cooper. Hi, Diana, and welcome back to the show. Hey, it's good to see you. It is so good to see <laughs> your face. <laughs> I know. It's been a minute. It has been a while, and it's so nice when I can look up and I just see you sitting <laughs> right there yeah, in I front know. of me. Yeah, I know. We need to get desks some side by side when I'm doing oh, my work. That would be so that nice. Be, wouldn't that be fun? You that know. would just be fun. <laughs> Although Isabel would probably get annoyed with all the chatter, but, you know. And, and I would have to say, but Diana, I can't turn it into an Excel right. document. <laughs> I'll do all that. <laughs> That's kind of an inside joke, yeah. folks, but but I, I will explain Late night it. grants <laughs> and such. Midnight. Midnight. Diana, I uh, want my mommy. Oh, <laughs> uh, Yeah. So there has been a whole lot happening in this community. So we're just going to kind of dive in here. Mm -hmm. Um, First of all, I have to mention the recall. Brookings City voters decisively voted on November 7th to recall Mayor Ron Hedensgog, Councillor Ed Schreiber, and Councillor Michelle Morosky for their decision to retain a convicted shoplifter as our city manager, in spite of the expressed wishes of their constituents. The unofficial tally was approximately two to one in favor of the recall. I think it was about 74 and 30 against. The county clerk has a couple of weeks to certify the results, and then those results come to the city where they will be recorded. The recalled officials step down and the positions are declared vacant. I'll have Dennis Treglia, one of the chief petitioners, back on the show soon to discuss the timeline and what's next. But this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. Yeah, I'm still, I think a lot of us don't know the process. I don't know many people knew the process because I'm not sure it's ever happened where we've had more than half the council recalled. I don't think, I, I don't know when the last recall was. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, either. I have no... So I think there's a lot of people that are saying, okay, now what happens? Right. Exactly. you know, we've never been through this before. So... Well, Jake even put it on, on Facebook on my post. He said, what now? Yeah. And right. It's like, okay, well, I don't know, right. actually. Yeah. Not, not <laughs> I guess sure. we'll find we'll out. We'll get back to you on I that. know. <laughs> I mean, the nice thing about Dennis is that he always has looked at what the next step is. Yeah, we don't have to. Exactly. There are people out there. (laughs) We can trust Dennis to look down the road a little bit. I know. So we are recording this on November 11th, which is Veterans Mm -hmm. Day. And Diana, you have some great news for the veterans in our community. And I would love for you to share that. Yeah, this has been a big project um, that I've been working on Actually, so I was approached last year, um, and I've spoken about this project on the show, I think, a few times, but I was approached last year um, by Adam, who is a local developer at AB Innovations, LLC, and he was looking into doing, you know, getting some low-income housing here, and um, he's really interested in seeing a lot of affordable housing, which is awesome as a developer, and you know, he'd approached me to potentially... And that's kind of rare. It is, because uh, so it's a it's Let's a celebrate that, yeah. It, it is, and I can understand why, you know, if you could choose between a for-profit, um, you know, building and and then doing this affordable housing where you're, you're really not going to see a lot of profit, I mean, almost none, <laughs> um, you know, I could see how that would be... It's a, it's a hard sell sometimes. Um, And the fact that this application process, which I'll go into in a little bit, is, um, you know, it's such a, well, I mean, it took us a few months to do the application. And those last few weeks were just really grueling. Yes, they were. (laughs) And, um, you know, there was a, we had to be basically, um, I had to put every other responsibility aside and just be ready to jump into a meeting at any time, any, any day or night. Yeah. So, um, it was really grueling, but, um, and that's one of the, you know, barriers with getting this kind of housing here. But uh, he approached me last year and I just, you know, we were just getting some of our prog- our basic programs off the ground and new staff coming in. And I just thought, well, you know, I don't have that kind of capacity. That's going to be some other agency is, you know, bigger agency that can do more than I can. Um, so I said no. And I think he, um, 
kind of took a shot at it on his own and, you know, he didn't have a lot of, yeah, a lot of agencies were kind of like, eh, I don't, you know, I don't think I have capacity for that. Um, so he came back around this year and I said, yeah, I think I, I think maybe I could do this. Um, and the more we got into it, the more I thought like, it's so competitive. And I thought, well, we're not going to get this. Even when we submitted the application, which, you know, August 22nd at 4 p.m. is etched into my brain because <laughs> for two months, I, it was just, I had to keep that in mm-hmm. mind. That was the day we turned in. So um, we turned it in and I said to him, I texted him, I said, you know, well, um, we may not get it, but because um, as a, you know, he's coming at it from a developer side and I'm coming at it uh, from a, a grant perspective. And I could see some things that, you know, we could have fleshed out better that could have been done better. And even he saw a few things that, oh, shoot, we forgot this. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, we we may not get it, but um, would you be willing to do it again if we, you know, next year when it comes around? He said, yeah, of course. So we waited, we waited. And gosh, it was so hard to wait. Um, And I I was doing some other writing, grant writing and projects in the meantime. And then a couple weeks ago, we got um, notification. Actually, we, we got a notification a few weeks ago that we um, our our application was moving to um, basically w- where they were going to ask for a r- reservation of funds for our project. So it was being recommended. Wow. Um, and then it went before the Housing Stability Council. Um, that's the state of Oregon's housing services. And they uh, moved our project through. Actually, they, they moved all the projects through. Wow. And so, and then we got, because um, OHCS does, so OHCS is Oregon Housing and Community Services. Um, and they do all of our housing funding through the state, similar to how like OHA does public health funding and mm-hmm. DHS does, you know, benefits and stuff. So um, OHCS sends out a newsletter whenever they have, you know, big applications and, and the awardees and they picked ours to highlight. So that was really exciting. Um, and Mayor Kaufman had a, in Gold Beach, had a quote in there as well. So yeah, it was really cool to see that. And just this is a um, this is probably the largest investment of um, OHCS funding in Curry County in oh, well over thirty years. Wow! And wow. it's the first affordable housing project to be built in Curry in twelve years. So, wow! It's, it's exciting. It is. So, <laughs> and, and, so tell me, yeah. what what is it? What? <laughs> so it's <laughs> yeah, it's a veterans housing project. So we're gonna this one is um, specifically for veterans. We're gonna have um, there's a property up in Gold Beach that we've worked with the owner and the realtor and then um, the city of Gold Beach, and it's a very nice property. Um, I mean, well, I won't mention it right here, but as we get closer to it, we're hoping to have a groundbreaking and invite the community out. We had a lot of community support, which is, I mean, in Gold Beach, in Gold Beach, yeah, which is interesting because mm-hmm. I always well, thought they were. No, they're doing. I mean, they're nice just for the last even few years, but probably for the last five years or so. Um, you know, they're trying to change every ordinance they can to to really help um, streamline uh, housing development of wow. all levels, which is great because you know, I yes, we do affordable housing. We we want to see that supported, but. We also love to see housing at all levels because somebody's ready to move into that middle income housing yep. that would open up low income housing for somebody else. So yep. Yep. Um, it is really important. I think we do have a lot of high end housing. And so I would love to see more middle to low income. But yeah, um, so they really are on the progressive side of, of, of housing construction mm-hmm. up there. So they worked with us. And the thing is about these grants, you can... You can get these, and even some of the shelter grants and all of that, you can get those without, um, you know, community support and without, you know, city and county buy-in. But it just puts more work on the person who's writing the grant and and building the program. And so it makes a world of difference. Um, And personally for me, as the person that was writing the grant, it makes a world of difference because I don't have to do as much digging. You know, people are coming to us with the, the information we need and um, and letters of support, which was, and you don't deal. have to fight them. Yeah, when we is, when we need something signed to get back right. to us, it's you know, I mean, um, the city administrator Anthony Pagano. It was gosh, maybe less than ten minutes. He got some of those zoning wow. forms back to us. Wow. So, and we were some of that was down to the, you know, down to the hour. Even mm-hmm. uh, we were submitting things, you know, up until four p.m. So, mm. 
It's a lot of work and it does take a lot of, it takes more than one person for sure. So, um, so this will be a property that's already developed. Um, it's, it already has units on it, um, mm-hmm. that are used for short term rental. And so it used to be apartments though. So we're just actually changing it back into apartments. Wow. Um, yeah. How nice. I know. And so it, it, it has, uh, some room for office space. It actually has some land across the street. We'll be putting in a community center for uh, for the residents only. Not it's not a traditional mm-hmm. community center that you would think of, but mm-hmm. um, it'll have laundry and you know a rec room and things like that. Because some of the units are going to be pretty small, mm-hmm. not just studio, but um, what's called an efficiency unit, which mm-hmm. is actually smaller than a studio. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we'll have some efficiency units. Um, we'll have a few. I think there are. Six, uh, 10 efficiency units, six one bedrooms, and two two bedrooms that we're hoping to turn into ADU or um, ADA compliant units. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So right. it'll be a mixture of rent rates, mm-hmm. I think anywhere from $400 to $1,000, depending on what unit. And then we'll also be working with the VA and um, Housing Authority to get what's called HUD VASH vouchers. Those are kind of like Section 8 vouchers for veterans. Mm hmm. Um, and we don't have a lot being used here in Curry, so we're confident we'll be able to get a voucher for every room. So this will specifically be low income, mm-hmm. specifically for veterans. Correct. So is it your sense that that veterans are especially hard hit in terms of being able to find housing, or you know, are they yeah. are there gaps? Yeah. So and. There's a few reasons why we picked this as our first project. Um, one reason is because there, when when we went to apply, um, there was a few different that we a few different applications we wanted to apply for. We wanted to apply for this one for veterans, and we wanted to apply for a small projects for senior housing. When we got to that last, you know, those last few weeks, and we started seeing um, kind of what was actually going to pan out. It looked more likely that um, the small projects um, applications, there wasn't even going to be enough money for. Wow. And so we it was either risk applying for both for this one project. And if we didn't get the small projects funding, we couldn't even afford to purchase the mm-hmm. units. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we shifted and did completely veterans housing. Mm-hmm. So when um, when they finally came back with all of the awards, we noticed that there was more than enough money in the veterans pot, whereas there was not enough in the small projects. So we we likely wouldn't have got it. Mm-hmm. It was competitive, mm-hmm. but there was enough funding in the veterans that all we had to do was make sure that our application met, met all the criteria. Right. Um, right. So there was no chance of uh, reducing what we were asking for. And it's really not a question of, of saying, well, you know, this person is more Mm-hmm. entitled to get housing than this person. Yeah, no, everybody know. here needs housing. Yes. And and I will say that even though it it seems like, okay, well, it was more likely we would get it, so we went for that. We only even went into these projects because we saw such a need. Veterans and seniors are, I mean, absolutely, there is a lack of housing for those two populations in our community. Um, and when I say seniors, also that means people with disabilities, because mm-hmm. usually senior housing is senior and people with disabilities. So that covers the majority of everybody we see that walk in our door. Not so everybody. In but... your work, you mm-hmm. do you see veterans? I mean, oh, veterans yeah. are walking through your door? Yeah. Um, so Dave's been working with veterans for in Curry County for at least the last eight years, probably. Wow. So he worked for ORCA and he did the SSVF program, which is um, supportive service for veteran families. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, you know, he was the one that helped him get their HUD VASH voucher, get into housing. Um, and he did a lot of coordination and case management mm-hmm. for veterans. So he comes with a lot of experience and, and connection. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he'll he be overseeing this project, Great. you know, as we get it rolling, as well as uh, our other housing projects. So. Mm-hmm. He'll ha- he'll be the best person, you know, when a veteran does walk through our door, which mm-hmm. we currently have um, anywhere from seven to ten veterans on our caseload at one time, um, and they're anywhere from you know someone in their forties to all the way up to their eighties. We wow. I think I think our oldest is somewhere in um, his early eighties. Wow. wow. So yeah, we we do have a lot. Um, they're used to Dave is his name, um, our case manager. They're used to Dave, and you know they've been working with him a long time. Mm-hmm. So. 
That's they excellent. They come in now, and right? yeah, that's just that's excellent. Yeah, how many, how many folks do you figure you're going to be able to get in house? there? Yeah. So I know um, pretty quickly we'll be able to fill all of the units because mm-hmm. not only um, will this be veterans inside our community, but there may be veterans close by along the coast and other areas that are on wait lists mm-hmm. that we can get in if they are able to port their vouchers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other piece of this is once we get through all of the applications that are um, eligible, and I don't know, we don't know all the specific criteria, so we have to wait until we know all those details. But once we get through all of those, we'll be able to process just general applications. So um, and it sounds like the state is uh, allowing us to, we would be able to process just, you know, people, uh, other community members. Mm-hmm. So we would likely then um, start prioritizing seniors and right. people's, people with disabilities. But I have a feeling it's going to be pretty full, mm. pretty quick, mm-hmm. um, and probably exclusively veterans. So exciting. Yeah. It's so exciting. I mean, it really, it, you know, as as I was saying, you know, one person is not more worthy of no, housing yeah. than another. But if there were people who are yeah. worthy of Our being housed. Our veterans are there. Right? Yes. Wouldn't it be them? Yeah. Wouldn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. And I know probably all of us have veterans in our family yeah. or, um, you know, loved ones. Yep. And I have a lot in my family. Yep. And so I, I had um, mentioned in a post this morning that, you know, my great grandfather was uh, in the infantry, in the army. Back in the 30s and I think 40s in Hawaii during mm-hmm. the time of, I don't know if he was there during Pearl Harbor, mm-hmm. but right around that time. And he wasn't even a, a naturalized citizen until 1982. Wow. So wow. 50 years before he became a citizen, he right. served um, our country for a long wow. time. And then mm-hmm. he moved to Gold Beach in 42. Mm-hmm. Um, he owned a lot of businesses up there and probably ones that, you know, older folks, you know, would remember that yep. I don't. But yep. Um, so it's really kind of cool to kind of be full circle with that. Well, this is really exciting mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned. And I, I do remember when you were in the in the throes of writing that yeah. grant. And I, I remember the crazed look in your yeah. eyes. So, yeah. yeah. Just <laughs> don't anybody bug me or talk to me or well, need anything. A federal, isn't it federal money? It's or, federal money that comes through, through the, the state. state. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so many different hoops that you have to jump through when you're when you're applying for federal money. I mean, oh, yeah. it's just it's crazy. And their portals are not easy. I know. Like they they created these portals in like the 80s and 90s and then they just never updated them or something. I know. Probably I, the same employee from there too. And I I have to say that I KCIW just finished writing a grant, yeah. and, and it was the same thing. We were going for federal, federal money, right? Yeah. FEMA, right? Right, right. The portal, <laughs> oh my, it would just disappear my work. I know. I, you it, have to be really insane. careful with that stuff. Wow. And also, um, well, they just, the way that they have it all set up, you know, especially for these housing grants, you have to download everything and there's spreadsheets and spreadsheets are not user friendly. I mean, yes. I'm in Excel yes. all the time. I <laughs> am a wizard, but those just, oh, they were so frustrating. Yeah. And you'd, one number wouldn't add up and you're like, which tab is messing it up? Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then you know, try uploading the documents. I know. <laughs> well, you know, some, some people need to update their um, software systems now, on now, their now. computers. <laughs> I'm like, you don't even have Adobe for crying out loud. I know. I didn't have Excel. Uh, no, I that know. What is problem. going on here? <laughs> you can't be messing around with these federal grants without those. I guess not. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I learned my lesson. Uh, yeah. So. so I'm thrilled about this this yeah. project. It's, it's just great. When, I can't wait when to do you, break ground. Yeah. When do you look forward well, to... Well, so <laughs> we're hoping to break ground actually by the end of the year, early next year maybe. Um, great. And then... I think I think Adam's projection on the grant was possibly groundbreaking in spring, but mm-hmm. I mean, some of those units may be ready to put people in within a few months. That'd be great. Um, and so we may even have some open by spring. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. But um, ultimately, by the end of 2024, it'll be fully uh, open and operating and wonderful. hopefully filled by Absolutely that point. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. So we, we're planning a groundbreaking ceremony and I don't have any tentative date. I just know it'll be end of this year to, you know, beginning of next year. Great. Um, and we're hoping to get 
uh, I mean, first of all, you know, if you're a veteran and and you want to go and just look at the place and and check it out, um, when we do that groundbreaking ceremony, it would really be really great to to have everybody up there. Um, it is in Gold Beach, and I'll give more location details and mm-hmm. time frame, you know, as we get closer to. Maybe you can have a bus or something. Yeah, we would, do have our I mean, new van, which. Uh, oh, yeah. So, although it only has a few seats, so maybe a bus would be better. <laughs> but um, yeah, and actually, we're hoping to get a couple of legislators that um, you know are really like minded on, uh, especially these veterans projects and the housing projects, because. Good. We are going to come at this again and try to, you know, continue developing more affordable housing here. We still have a lot of seniors out on the street, so. And I think that it, for years and years, it, it's been that Curry County's been kind of the stepchild. Yeah. Um, really, you know, we've yeah. been basically ignored. Although I, I found out recently why we were ignored at least in terms of emergency uh, FEMA money. Mm -hmm. And it's because we never applied for any money. Right. Well, that's actually the crux of all of the issues is, um, you know, we, I see uh, there's probably, I mean, several millions of dollars that Curry County would have been, um, it's rightfully ours through the, the state, you know, housing agencies um, that just, it was never applied for. That was all. Because there's, mean, you know, somebody has to step up and, and apply. And yeah, actually write the grant. Right. right? So yeah. it's yeah. one of those catch 22s where do you have the capacity to write for the grant that's mm-hmm. building the capacity? And, mm-hmm. you know, in, in this case, uh, you know, it would take an agency to have that. But in your case, you know, that very much should have been probably local government agencies having written for those grants all along. So much money is on the table to help develop and um, support Curry County. And that doesn't mean, you know, develop us into Salem or Portland or anything like that. It means develop what we need. We get to say what we need. So, And, you know, I've heard that time and time from one person or another that we're walking away and leaving the money on the the table. And, And I didn't know what they were talking about. I now know what they're talking about. There are literally millions of dollars sitting on the table. And all we have to do as Curry County Mm -hmm. is say, we'd like some of that. Yeah. And they're willing to even help you write the stuff, right? Yeah, that's the thing is, uh, I mean, you know, again, it's still clunky and difficult and all of that. But a lot of the grants that we're getting now, and I think the state, specifically Oregon, is very progressive in the way. And by the way, when I say progressive throughout all this, I really don't mean the political sense. I mean, Looking ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and Oregon is very progressive in a lot of its um, new policies around housing and health care. And so one of the things that they've done, um, specifically like the Measure 110 grant, these um, some of the rapid rehousing grants that I have, you know, I don't even think I've spoken on those yet. Um, they offer a lot of TA support and they TA. pay for it. Oh, technical assistance. Thank yeah. you. They offer a lot I of support some and they of that. pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to get one through the state of Oregon somehow. That's Yeah. I don't know. I don't think the federal government, uh, I think they take away any support you have. They I just, know. They just, you know, know. <laughs> bash you in the knees or something. Uh, but Painful. yeah. 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 So we've, we've gotten really good support and we just got a um, consultant that we'll be working with on uh, to help us make sure we're managing Excellent. all these federal grants well, because it's, it's a doozy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a day yeah. in the park. It mm-hmm. really isn't. So what about shelter? Yeah, I know. So shelter is, for for those that don't know, we've, over the last few years, we've um, stepped in to provide emergency shelter, winter shelter, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2021 to 2022, I think there was a good eight or nine months where we worked with uh, the Curry Homeless Coalition and the um, the food bank to provide shelter locally mm-hmm. um, during the winter. It was also for COVID relief as well. So there was right. there was a few different um, purposes, and the state just rented out an entire motel for us, which that's the way you have to do it. You know, it's because, you know, if tourist season hits and you have someone that's in need, good luck. Yeah. I don't care if they're on the verge of death. You're not, you no. know, you're not going to find anything. No. So you have to have some sort of, uh, not necessarily organization owned, but you have to have some sort of autonomy mm-hmm. over the shelter beds or mm-hmm. else... Uh, you know, they're not accessible. So the state rented it out. 
Um, that went pretty well. There was a lot we learned. And then the second year, uh, Curry Homeless Coalition, I think they mostly worked theirs out of Gold Beach. They, there was some down here. And then we ran one as well alongside them. Um, so we had a separate motel that we kind of rented out about half of it. Uh, and that went really well. We provided, I think, up to 60 hours of case management on site. And we had 10 rooms, which ultimately housed uh, 14 individuals. Nice. Because a few of them went on to do something else and opened up a room. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that closed April 1st. And so it's because it's just for the winter. Um, and it turned out that was actually just COVID funds, mm -hmm. um, probably from CARES Act or, or something mm -hmm. like that. So we we didn't think we were going to get one this year. Um, we were told there was no out of the cold funds and mm. no, we didn't see any emergency shelter funds. So we kind of wrote it off and said, well, we're not going to have one and told everybody we weren't. And then, uh, the state, uh, passed, well, the governor passed an executive order to push out some shelter funds and wow. they reached out to us and said, we'll just give you exactly what you had last year. Wow. So. Wow. That right now that is in uh process. Mm -hmm. I mean so the state does move a lot faster than the federal government, but um you know with all these new executive orders, mm -hmm. OHCS is I mean they are busy scrambling. Oh, all the time mm -hmm. um to make sure that they understand everything that they're pushing mm -hmm. out and that they can offer TA and um sometimes you know they get it all out as they're writing the contracts. So <laughs> It's been a, a lot for them, too. Um, I bet. We're really grateful for them, and we're really grateful for the governor for all of these executive orders to make yep. this happen. Yep. So um, this will be uh, something we'll we'll put out on the website, sure. along with everything else. Because um, when I heard there wasn't going to be a winter shelter, yeah. I, I was just... I know. We were... It was so upsetting. Everybody was, wow. and we had to tell a lot of our clients who were really... Some of them really need it. They mm -hmm. do. And, you know, they were very hopeful. And so mm -hmm. that was really hard to tell them. Um, and then just maybe a week later, we got a surprise email that. that, you know, we're going to get the funding. Because when you think about what it was like last year, mm -hmm. that cold spell. Yeah, that wasn't, was... Wasn't that last year? That was in March. The end of February. February. That was going February. Into, yeah. It's like, That wow. was also such a blur. And that was... We stored up a, a warming center, which is quite different than a, a winter shelter. Mm -hmm. the sh a shelter, for those who don't know, a, a warming center and a shelter are different in that a warming center is not um, somewhere where people usually sleep. In fact, it's typically um, just like a warming station for mm -hmm. at night. And so they're not really supposed to sleep there. And that has a lot to do with um, the emergency factor of it, but also that, you know, it's not staffed like a shelter. Um, so a winter shelter, they actually can be there at night and during the day if mm -hmm. you have it set up that way and they can actually sleep and keep their belongings there. But a warming center, usually they vacate during the day and find somewhere. But And really, it's not it's not so hideous if you vacate during the day as long as the rain isn't horizontal. Right. And, you know, and, and there were degrees. a few days where it mm -hmm. was very cold when we were yeah. You know, and we, we only had so many volunteers because it's also usually volunteer run, mm -hmm. which is why it's, you know, it's not supposed to be somewhere where they're, the reason why everybody's not supposed to be asleep is fire hazards and, and right. things like that. Because it's not, it, it's just an emergency station. It's right. not really set up for And all yet that. it's mm -hmm. overnight. And it's I can't guarantee warm. we kept everybody awake. <laughs> exactly. So I mean, um, really, we did our these people just best. go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I would. So yeah, I, know. Um, I think, yeah, it, it ran really well. And mm -hmm. then the shelter, you know, that went much better last year. And um, we're looking forward to this year. We were hoping for a November 15th opening date, but we have to wait for that final award from the state. So we, we just have to wait a mm -hmm. night. It may end up taking another few weeks, which does suck, but yeah, um, yeah, that's just what we have to wait for. Well, so. and we can hope that the weather doesn't get hideously cold. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it hasn't kind been of, horribly cold. You we've know. had a bit of flux. There's been a yep. few pretty chilly nights, and mm -hmm. the rain, you know, doesn't make it any better. No, so exactly. I'm I'm hoping it stays off for a few more weeks. Now, is there a winter warming? Is there a is there a, a warming center? Warming center, yeah. So there won't. I mean, a warming center would stand up, sort of on an emergency basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The question would really be: Is there a are there set plans and location if 
a warming center is needed? And the mm-hmm. answer is no. Oh. Um, because, uh, so after we had that warming center, we did go down and kind of had a debrief with the, uh, well, with the city, actually, mm-hmm. city of Brookings. And some of what was said, I'm not sure if all of them, some of them understood, you know, that that actually isn't on us to do. Um, we we stepped in and that's something we're prepared to do in the future, but it requires. You mean your organization core. Right, yeah. right. It's not, it's not like a core function. Mm-hmm. It's more of a um, local government function. Mm-hmm. That, those are things usually that are... Um, organized by local government, even if it's not run or even facilitated by local government. Right. Usually it's initiated by local government. And there's some funding through local government to make that happen because it's their jurisdiction and right. um, it's their responsibility to make sure that people are safe and, and don't die on the street. Right. So um, what was said to us afterward, you know, for the most part, well, we had, it was really good feedback from the city and I think um, maybe some intent to partner or work together in the future. Um, Obviously, there's a lot going on for the city, and so we have not been able to come back around to it. Mm -hmm. Um, I've reached out a few times, I think probably May or June, Mm -hmm. um, and didn't hear back much. And so it may just be on their back burner at this point. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, what needs to happen is the city needs to develop a plan. Um, They need to allocate funds in case of an emergency, and then um, even go so far as to help to identify a location and then have all of that written into the plan and then reach out for, I mean, reach out for bids from agencies on what they could provide. Right. I would think that they would want to get, you know, several plans from different agencies or work with one agency that has, you know, partner support so that they know that it, that's right. everybody's going to be on board with that. Um, you know, what Rogue Retreat did in, in Medford, uh, the city kind of came and said, we have land, we have money, we will help support to get more funds, and we have um, some supplies, and then we have personnel that will work with you guys to make this happen. Wow. Is there an agency that will step up? And Rogue Retreat stepped up, and other agencies said, you know, we're, we'll supply this if mm-hmm. Rogue Retreat can be the primary. So that's what needs to happen here. Um, right. And we would definitely throw you know, our weight behind that and our support because we we have the capacity, we have um, the grants coming in, and we have the ability to apply for more funding. So, uh, but without those kind of important pieces from the city that need to happen first, um, it's probably going to happen in an emergency again. Right. And I can't guarantee that, you know, I can say that we'll all pull together and do our best, but I can't guarantee it would happen because yeah. it really needs to be planned out ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it was amazing what everybody managed to pull oh, truly. off last yeah. year. Amazing. I, I don't think that would have been able to happen a few years before. No, I don't either. Not in that way with that much success because right. we count success that, you know, we were able to fill all of the spaces we had. Um, essentially, there was, you know, a few spaces we probably could have fit more people, but. We were able to get a significant amount of people out of the snow, yeah, which is unheard was, of for here. Yeah, I know, there was. Snow I know. Even on when the I ground. say it, I'm like, it wasn't just the cold; it was snow. I know. Inches. I know. In my yard. Yeah. I never have snow in my I yard. Know, we built a snowman. I know. It's crazy. So he didn't last long, but no. he was there. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, what about traditional housing? Transitional. Transitional. Yeah. Traditional. Yeah. Um, transitional, although, traditional. <laughs> um, yeah. So in transitional housing, for people who don't know, is um, housing where you're there for anywhere from six months. Usually you're not there less than six months mm-hmm. um, unless it really is my house will be available in a few months and I just need somewhere to be. So what are Usually you transitioning from? You're transitioning from to? either the street, mm-hmm. uh, like you're completely unsheltered, or you're um doubled up and you're with so which is still homelessness Mm -hmm. um or you're transitioning from a shelter um, and you're transitioning to long-term housing meaning you'll you don't have to move unless you want to so there's long-term which is uh, permanent housing Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't like i said you're on a lease it's whatever month to month or year to year and you you don't leave unless you're evicted or um, you choose to move out and just like the you know all of us rent and then there is transitional housing which is typically 6 months to 2 years mm-hmm. and you're so you you'd be in a, either an apartment or um 
you could be in. Like what we're hoping to see happen is there's a house uh, with, you know, seven bedrooms essentially. And some of those bedrooms would be transitional housing. So oh. the person would be in, they would have their own room. Mm-hmm. Usually they're either their own bathroom or a shared facility mm-hmm. um, and then shared kitchen. So it's just a, you know, kind of rooms in a house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it would be staffed because transitional housing um, has case management and really a lot of support. Usually there's um, community partner space and all of that for other services. So case management in in that context is is what? Basically kind of keeping yeah. people connected to services that they yeah. need? Or? Yeah. It's, case management is where you're... So there's there's kind of like peer support and advocacy, which is just, um, you know, you have some really light needs and you're just like, I need someone to talk to every once in a while or um, someone help me with paperwork sometimes. Case management is really long-term goal setting. So, you know, you you meet with your case manager prior to going in and you talk about um, kind of what goals you want to work on. Like maybe you get in um, transitional housing and you don't even have income yet. So mm. part of your plan might be to establish income, mm. whether that's an employment or social security or um, uh, some other benefits, something like that. Mm-hmm. So you you would put together a plan um, kind of the, the idea of transitional housing is to move you into long-term permanent housing. So what do you need to be successful in long-term permanent housing? So it's, it's different for everybody. So we would do, um, an assessment and come up with like an individual plan for everybody. And then they would meet with their case manager, however often it kind of, that it demands, mm-hmm. I guess some people could be a few times a week. Some mm-hmm. people could be just once or twice a month, mm-hmm. you know, it depends, um, yeah. Now, I know that some of the um, some of the real challenges for people here is not only physical health but also mental health. Mm-hmm. There just isn't a lot, yeah, and available. And we're still, I think, trying to get up to services here, is my understanding. So I know we have Adapt, um, and then we do have, especially for mental health. Well, actually, mental health and addictions, there are a lot of telehealth resources now that, you know, people have access to, which, so I, I hear a lot of conversation about, you know, Measure 110, and um, there's there's definitely a lot of um, misinformation that I hear. Mm. And one of the things that I hear is that it either hasn't created shelter beds or it hasn't made access to treatment easier. And that's not true at all for us in Curry County. That may be true in other places where they actually have a lot of treatment beds. Um, Interestingly, it might have made it more difficult for them to access treatment beds in their own community because we've now expanded access across the state to those Ah. beds. So that's part of it. But there actually have been beds built um, and there's transitional housing now that's in place for people who are going into treatment, waiting for a bed, and also people getting out that need to transition. That's great. And we're actually hoping that um, some of our transitional housing might be able to be used for people leaving treatment who are ready to, you know, get a job, get into permanent housing. Mm-hmm. Um, because once you get back into the community, if you don't have housing, it's it's so much easier to relapse or, you know, commit um, any kind of, you know, additional issues that you you may have going on legally. Yep. So it's transitional housing is really important for that. And I know that we've had a lot easier time getting people access to mental health and addiction treatment, but it hasn't necessarily been services based in our community. Ah, So um, we really access a lot of telehealth for people. And I mean, that's one thing that we, as uh, not just us, but, you know, social service providers in general have always asked, well, why don't we have more telehealth? And it's almost been there's so many things before COVID where it was like, no, you can't. There's legal reasons why we can't. We can never do that. It's a it's a risk. It's a breach. It's a whatever. Right. Um, you know, probably a lot of lawyers sitting around a table deciding these factors. Right. And then COVID hit and they said, no, you have to do this now. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is the only way now. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've gotten back to where now you have options and we've kind of come to a um, – the pendulum has sort of ended up in the middle. And so now we have kind of the best of both worlds in some sense. Um, 
some yeah, areas. Some of the mm-hmm. I, it's, it's so much easier. Like if you've got you know somebody who's disabled, for instance, like my husband, yeah. it's so much easier to do a telehealth it visit is. with his doctor. It is. Why are Why are we not doing that to begin with? Exactly. You know, when exactly. I have to take my dad over to Medford, and we go in, and he sits there for an hour waiting, and we go in, and the doctor looks at his labs and says, "All right, everything looks good. Come back in six months." I'm like. Why did we drive here? Exactly. They didn't even weigh you. Exactly. And I could have done that. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, telehealth, I, there's always been telehealth, but it's been, you know, everybody's like, well, it's too risky. It's, you know, this it's too risky for mental available. health. It's too risky for yeah. addiction. Exactly. Like, that's just not something we'll ever see. And yeah. then, bam. Yeah. You have to now. And so, um, like I said, thankfully, now we have the option of, of either. And mm. for communities that had a lot of resources, yeah, it might actually look a little bit more jammed up in their area. But for mm-hmm. Curry, I mean, it just created a huge access point for us. So that's really good news. Yeah. Because there's is. a lot of mental health issues here. It is. And so we do some behavioral health services. Most of that's, you know, referrals mm-hmm. and getting people to the appropriate agencies. Um, but we also, you know, in looking at transitional housing and shelter and all of that, you know, we have partners here and we have partnerships around the region and the state. So we're we're confident that, you know, we'll be able to work with people to get them where they need to be if that's the case. Excellent. Um, and there's there's just a lot of providers now available to us. So oh, that's great. That's great. So how how does it help mm-hmm. to get people who are either completely unhoused or Mm, sort of unhoused. Yes. How, yeah, unstable, how does it yeah. help all of us to help oh, yeah. them? So, I mean, there's some really like obvious ways, you know, we have, we would have reduced law enforcement. When we had, um, when we had the first winter shelter for nine months, um, we were told that it dramatically reduced 911 calls. Wow. Um and the thought that some people had was, well, but it'll it'll just shift them to this one area then. And that did not happen. The entire eight or nine months we had that shelter, there was, I think, two – no, there was one 911 call and it was for emergency services. It was for an ambulance. Wow. Um, there were police that showed up when we requested, you know, and it, there was no emergency. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a few times, I think, where we requested some support just to make sure we could deal with something appropriately. But, yeah, there was no mm-hmm. – there was really no issues, and we kind of kept up on everything. And same with the second year. I, I can't even remember there being a 911 call that second year. There was one medical call again. That's mm-hmm. what. Mm-hmm. So um, it – that's one of the obvious ways that it helps. You know, it does reduce, uh, it reduces probably some of the stress on businesses and tourism and all of that mm-hmm. um, because typically we're, you know, pulling people in who are really fragile or who really are kind of having a hard time out on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, so it reduces 911 calls even for medical mm-hmm. um, because less people have medical issues. So that that's kind of one of the main ways. It also, and I'm not just talking about shelter, I'm talking about transitional housing, I'm talking about long-term housing. Um, It also put, it does put money back into the economy, especially when you're talking um, long-term housing and transitional housing. People are able to get jobs, people are able to, even in the shelter, uh, we had, I think, four or five people get jobs. And so that's money, you know, going back into the economy here. Um, That's money that's being spent to support families so that other resources can be used for those who don't have it. So- it stabilizes people. You know, there's less doctors and hospital visits. Because there are still people who are living in their cars and working. Absolutely, yeah. I mean. Yeah, that, and that's really hard because it, it is difficult for them to find places to camp and sleep. Um, and so we. Especially if there's mm-hmm. a city ordinance that makes it illegal to do that. Well, they don't stay in that. the city. Yeah. <laughs> no, they don't stay in the city anymore. I Some oh, do. You, you, there may be people that think, well, I saw someone, you know, mm-hmm. on there's someone on my road or something. But mm-hmm. at this point, most people, even when they're new in town, they kind of get the hint that, yeah, just go outside the city limits. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that's ODOT and Forest Service and the county and all of them, uh, which sometimes is a little bit easier in those spaces. But ultimately, we just need housing for everybody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 yeah. it's not I, – I don't think it's such a big ask. 
No. Uh, no, because, no, I mean, well, what else would we do? I'm not sure what else we would do. I know. I know. They're, they're not going to go away. Yeah. And even if today you, you got everybody out of the community that was homeless, um, tomorrow it could be someone else. I mean, you it can't just keep... It will be somebody else. Yes. It's not, so not just can be, but I will be. I had heard, um, this was actually a counselor up in um, Port Orford, and they, they have a pretty great counsel up there, but there mm. was one individual at the, I think the last meeting I listened to that said, well, you know, maybe if they go over to that place, they get trespassed and then they go somewhere else and they get trespassed and maybe they'll get trespassed out of town. Well, okay, that's one person, but you could trespass everybody today out of town. Well, you can't, but you no. if you did, yeah. again, there are going to be more because these are people within our own community losing their housing. Right. So you cannot have a policy that just says, well, once you lose housing, you have to leave. That that does not. That and and it's not somebody who's shooting up, right? right? Yeah. I mean, no. These, yeah. these are people who are getting kicked yeah. out of their home because the owner has decided to renovate. Well, there's a million reasons why. I mean, really, exactly. Or that, they lost their job. Yeah. Like so, the the biggest one that we see now, yes, it, it is that you know people are doing renovations, and so they they want to fix it up. They want to mm -hmm. raise the rent, and and I'm not. I don't have anything disparaging to say about landlords for sure. I have a great landlord. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the truth. That is a big reason why. It, it is not the only reason. And um, I think that some of the problem we see is that people deal in absolutes here. Mm -hmm. And they think, well, it's either, it, it's all this, this, everybody that's out there, it's this problem. Right. But that is never the truth. Um <laughs> I was Every thinking of that. case is I was different. thinking of that Star Wars. You probably haven't watched Star Wars, have you? No. Well, occasionally. Oh, okay. Yeah. They say only Sith steal in absolutes. You know, the Siths are the oh the dark ones. So okay. yeah. you know, don't don't go there. Don't do <laughs> No absolutes. I know that's absolutely my, my no nerdy absolutes. side coming out. Yeah. <laughs> um Okay, so are there any other plans? Oh, so for any many. How much time do we have? Oh, well, we have ten, like looks eleven to me minutes. Like we got about um, ten yeah. minutes left. So I guess I won't go into all of the things. Yeah. So we have actually been working really hard to start developing our programs into more um, kind of succinct programs, as mm. opposed to okay, we had this resource navigation, which was sort of a catch-all. If you need a case management, you went in there, and we just figured it out once you were in there. And now we're really trying to, um, specifically because some of the grants we have are allowing us to develop programs, but also some of the work we're doing, we want to fine tune it. And so Good. we've sort of developed into, we have housing programs now, um, and then we have health programs. Mm -hmm. So the housing programs, that includes this low-income housing, uh, the transitional housing that we're working on getting together, and that's in Brookings, by the way, um, and then um, shelter so shelter will probably be under its own category because usually emergency shelter is kind of its right. own thing. Um, and then we're – oh, also rapid rehousing. So this was another emergency order uh, from the state. I think it's EO 2302, which came from House Bill 5019. So that was an emergency order back in April to award housing and shelter funds to rural counties because last year they did it. And they awarded it to all the other counties, and they said, "Well, rural doesn't really have enough data to support it." And we said, "Excuse That's me, that's because we don't have enough capacity because you haven't funded uh, it. So you need to give us the money anyway, and assume that there are people in need." Right. So what they did was they took our point in time count, which is another project we'll be mm -hmm. maybe briefly mentioning. Um, this is why it's so important that we do this point in time count every. It's every two years, but we can do it every year, mm -hmm. and we would like to. But um, that's why this is so important because when this executive order happened, she they just took the ne the last point in time count data and used that to wow. to divvy out the funding. Right. And we know we were short. The good news is everybody's short, so mm -hmm. we're probably all you know right. not getting enough. Right. But um, so we were awarded. Uh, Curry County was awarded just under six hundred thousand uh, dollars. We had to form a local planning group, which is multiple agencies. Basically, they call it a multi-agency – no, I don't remember what the C stands for now. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. multi-agency group. So it was us, Neighbors to Neighbors in Port Orford and the Curry Homeless Coalition in Gold Beach. 
Um, all three of us decided to work together on this project. We formed the Curry County Homeless Task Force, which is not under the county itself. It's actually a, a autonomous group. I don't know how many people are familiar with homeless task forces, but they're essentially a group of agencies. You can have local government and law enforcement, but it's not overseen by them. Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes it a little more flexible. Right. Um, and so we formed that. And then the three agencies we broke off kind of did a work group and applied for this funding. Uh, Brookings Correspondence is sort of the, I don't know about lead agency, but we're, we're the recipient of the funds. Mm -hmm. So we will sub-recipient those funds to the other agencies. Um, that's federal funds, and that is specifically to get people off the street and into housing. So Correct. we'll be able to um, guarantee rent for, mm -hmm. you can do short term, which I think is up to four months of rent or six months maybe, or you can do long term, which is like, I mean, you could go as high as I think 18 months or two years Excellent. where you pay their rent. Right. So we will decide on an, a, a length of time, mm -hmm. and then when when somebody is approved, then we set that funding aside for their rent for all Excellent. of that time. And they still get case management. Um, you know, the intent is while we're paying their rent, they're finding work, they're saving up, they're getting some of their other stuff paid off if there's debts or right. legal issues. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the rapid rehousing. Good. And then... Um, there's probably going to be some other housing ones coming up, and I'll have to go over those later because mm -hmm. I know we don't have time. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, how quickly can I talk? I, uh, about a lot faster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell so, tell us about the pit count quickly. Yeah. Okay. January. Well, I did mention the, the health programs, which I'll just briefly oh, mention. Right. We have We are working on medical respite, which is housing for people who are living on the street. It's usually very, very transitional, just you know, a few weeks to a mm -hmm. few months. Um, to make sure that they, when they're discharging from the hospital, that they don't readmit, mm -hmm. um, and that we you know we would follow them um, also with case management after that. But it's also to prevent people from going to the emergency room. So if there's some major issue, and that one is usually not something they can refer themselves to, um, but we'll have more information about that as we develop it. Um, and then the other is hospital consultation, which is us working with the hospital and hopefully doctor's offices at some point Excellent. so that if they have patients that either at the hospital they're discharging, that they feel need more support, uh, they don't have to be homeless. They they can have housing and maybe just not have support or um, be low income. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's where we got the hospital van or the wheelchair van. So that will be part of that program. Excellent. And um, there's probably more that I'm forgetting, but I don't I have time for that. I just about um, running out of time. So today. I'll go point in time count. <laughs> so I'd like to actually next time we meet, I'll kind of go over point in time count a lot. But essentially point in time count is um, the HUD census for people who are living unsheltered or in a shelter. Um, and we just literally, we hit the street and we have stations set up at different locations. So we'll have one at, um, we'll have one at uh, St. Timothy's, we'll have one at the food bank and we'll have one at Brookings Core Response. And then we also organize a, 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 another station, which is actually not a station. It's going out and doing brush count. So we actually hit the streets all day into the evening. Um, and this year, well, 2024, it's January 24th, 2024 is the actual day day right. that we have to count for. So and all across the country, right? we do need volunteers. We'll probably need several teams for brush mm -hmm. count and for each station. Mm -hmm. So I'll have more info out on our website um, as we get closer to January. And I'll um, have you back on the show. Yeah, I'll, you know. I'll go into that a lot more, yeah. I think, when we yeah. get to that. Yeah. So I would think that in general, uh, you need some help. Yeah, and yeah. sleep. You look you look a little bit like you're drowning yeah. over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's, it's been, a good problem to have. Though. I, I was doing so good this year at not working on weekends or in evenings. Yeah. I was doing so good. Yeah, and then August hit, and yeah. those grants hit. Yeah, and now I'm back to working weekends. Yahoo! Yay! So, so you need some volunteers. Yes, need some volunteers. Uh, you'll be hiring. We will be hiring staff. for probably anywhere from four to six staff in the next, um, you know, before spring. Wow. So, wow, that's great. Yeah, we need a bigger office. That's oh, my goodness. <laughs> so how do people get in touch with you? What's yeah. the, what's the best way? So they, if, if you're somebody that's looking for services, the best way is probably to come into the office, which is located right next to Budmar out in Harbor in the shopping center. 
So 97900 Shopping Center Avenue, number 31. Um, or you can call 541-251-0825 and Kathleen will figure out where you need to go. Um, I've met it, Kathleen, by the yeah, way, and she is a delightful she human is, being. and yeah. so good at her job. Yeah. <laughs> she's so good at what she does. I'm yeah. very grateful. Yeah. Um, and uh, so also probably the best way to figure out information is to go on the website. I, I just spent all morning updating it very well. So I didn't um, know you were IT as well. I am all of the... Oh, that's not even <laughs> IT. That's, is there anything you that, aren't? That is comms. That's a whole other job. Oh, boy. Yeah. So I'm also oh. our communications and outreach. Boy. Yeah. You think you might want to hire her. I know. I'm working on it. <laughs> all, all of these grants will enable me to hire some additional Good. people. And why that's great is because people will start seeing more programs develop because I'll have time to start um, yes. you know, going after the, this funding that Curry County's just never had time to well, do. And also you'll be employing local people. Yeah, I mean, there's Generally some speaking, that's here. where yeah. your people come from. Oh my from. gosh, last time we did um, applications for the peer support, we had, I think, 10 or 11. Wow. And there was one that I think we were like, okay, maybe this isn't the best fit for this role, but mm-hmm. still not a bad candidate for things. But all of the other ones, just amazing candidates. Like I couldn't, I don't even know if I could pick a next one wow. in line. So wow. there, yeah, there's great people here. Um, and by having other positions opening up, you're actually giving people work. Right? Yeah. I mean, they can, they can afford then to pay rent and buy their groceries and yeah. I mean, it's... yeah, and some of the even some of the people that applied here, you know, um, are are I think one was living in a motel even at that time, and so mm. yeah, the more we can, the more we can create incomes for people while we're doing this work because this is our you know our tax money, our all of our funding that goes up to the state, out to the federal government, and we never pull it back. And so not only are we pulling it back, we're creating housing, we're creating jobs. And that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. So, um, no, exactly. Yeah, and and great. by by raising the level of the water, we mm-hmm. all all the boats yep. go up. I mean, yes, because now you know, like I said, in with this one grant, we can we can be the recipient and and do sub recipient, so we can take on that administrative burden. Um, so really, raising our capacity does help the capacity of other agencies yep. and vice versa. Yep. So yep, and it makes a better community. I mean it it just yeah. it just does. If you're if you're actually well, helping people. There are a lot of people I I love volunteer work and I've always yeah. loved volunteer work. And there are a lot of people who do want to find that place mm-hmm. where they make a difference, yeah. even if it's just one day a week. And I have to tell you, like we have one of the best volunteers ever. Like she came in before we even had volunteers. And I was like, I don't even know what to ask you to do or how to use you. And yeah. she just dug in. Wow. She's been with us for over a year. Wow. And our second volunteer, we ended up hiring. That's so, great. yeah, we we love people to come in. If you're just like, I just want to do a few hours, mm-hmm. come see us at the front. We will put you to work where you get to meet people and, and see people. Yeah. All right, Diana. We're we're flat out of time, honey. Yeah, I talked I'm, fast. <laughs> you, you did. And you got a lot in. And I'm proud of you. <laughs> I drink my coffee this morning. <laughs> I know, I know. So I want to thank you for everything that you do out there in the community. I know people's lives have been impacted yeah. because of what you do. And congratulations on all the success <laughs> and hoping for a whole lot more. Yeah. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. The saying that it takes a village is often right on point. When we all pull together, we can affect the quality of life for all of us, with no one left out. As we enter this holiday season, wouldn't it be great if we each did something to improve someone's life? Sometimes even the smallest kindness can make a huge difference. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community.